Now that we have established why governments exist, we are going to build some depth on each of its functions. Today's lesson is all about what justice is and how we can apply it. I'm Pragmatic Penguin, let's get to it. Since the beginning of political philosophy with Socrates, the question of what justice is has plagued the subject. While it is a long and fascinating history, it's not necessary to understand the whole of it to get to the point, because the debate has a lot to do with where the philosophers start. Socrates takes a top-down approach, observing society and determining justice for the individuals through that lens. Utilitarians take an ends approach, determining justice by the end state. And social contract theorists take an origins approach, determining justice by what is necessary to escape the state of nature. In answering the question of why government exists, I use the approach of the contract theorist because that is the one based most in reality rather than abstraction. It makes no sense to change that course now. The theorist whose approach is summarized in this video is the American political philosopher John Rawls and from his book A Theory of Justice. Now imagine yourself in a room of people, except you have no knowledge of your own particulars. Your skills, your intellect, your health, your age, your education are all unknown to you. But you do understand the general and you understand people. This is what Rawls terms the original position, and this lack of knowledge is termed the veil of ignorance. From this original position, as opposed to the state of nature, you are capable of envisioning not merely a preferable society, but a perfect society. Your stake in this discussion is that you will then be plunged into the society, and since you do not know your own particulars, it is clear that you may be the worst off of all people within the society. Now it is also possible you may be the best off in this society. But instead of focusing on that, you would want to hedge your bets and create a society that you would be willing to live even if you were in the bottom 1% of it. This is a self-interested approach, which comes most natural to humans. Here is where we begin. We start with the things that are unacceptable no matter their probability. Things which everyone in society will be promised no matter their wealth. This gives us personal sovereignty, or what is more commonly referred to as liberty. Now, society changes liberty, but it doesn't necessarily diminish it. While you are no longer free to murder, you are free from murder, at least systematically. The same for all other violent crimes. And this is because the goal switches from allowing you absolute freedom to securing you from the freedom of others, which gives you the maximum possible value of freedom, no matter how rich or poor you are. Now, it's important to understand that liberties are traded. Sometimes they come into conflict with each other. When we have to decide which liberty triumphs over the other, this is where we fall back to our values. The common example here would be the case of yelling fire in a crowded movie theater where there is none. This act could cause a panic and result in harm to any given person in the room, all for one person's freedom to speak. Since this speech brings about violence and infringes on others' personal sovereignty, this is an unacceptable action. The press is free to publish for whatever purpose it pleases unless that purpose is to incite violence, because, once again, violence is a violation of person's sovereignty. Sovereignty here being defined as the right to self-governance, and with regards to violence referring to the physical body. Now, is a society that values personal sovereignty and trades liberty only for liberty really all you need to feel comfortable jumping right in? Have you done everything in both an intelligent and rational way to assure yourself the best possible position in this society? Not quite. This society, if left by itself, would be vastly unequal. While there is a chance that you could be absurdly wealthy, there is a much better chance that you could wind up completely impoverished. Is abolishing inequality the answer? Probably not. Humans have a lot of variety. Some are athletic, some are brilliant, some are hardworking, some are pretty, and some are just plain unlucky. And that's a bit of the point. You see, the person behind the veil of ignorance, that's us before luck is applied. Our attributes are a result of luck. Right place, right time, right circumstances, right household, and right parents. These aren't things you get to choose, and when you do make the choice, it's because you were lucky enough to be in a position to do so. We aren't entitled to our gifts, we're lucky. But by not rewarding these gifts, we aren't realizing their potential and failing to capitalize on the non-zero-semness we all gathered to create. While inequality isn't pretty, it must exist to improve the general welfare. The question is, how? We make it conditional. Since the worst off in society are closest to the state of nature, they should receive reward for participating in a structure which they are ultimately the bottom of. In other words, inequality should exist for the benefit of the least advantaged members of society. 
Though this is to the benefit of all since society is much safer when people are least desperate. Remember, we want to give ourselves the best chance at the best life. $100 to a person who earns a million dollars a year is significantly less than $100 to a person who earns a thousand. So we want a system that redistributes some of that wealth accordingly. Not too much so that gift sharing is disincentivized, but enough so that the worst positions avoid being in a similar place as they would be in the state of nature, since that is what we all agreed to leave. So the question now is, what about liberty? Can we trade liberty to benefit the least advantaged? The answer is no. We can never trade liberty for anything other than liberty, as that has a negative sum impact on the entirety of society. Humans are born to be free, and society should serve to give all of them an advantage in this regard. This is what we call a lexical order, and that the first condition must be met for the second to be applied, and the first is untouched at that point. This is a basic outline of justice as fairness. In this video, we took the issue of justice and applied the concepts of the original position in Veil of Ignorance to determine two rules for how justice can be applied to society. The first is to preserve liberty as much as possible, and the second is to allow for inequality as long as it is to the benefit of the least advantaged. With this, we can now communicate much more effectively about actions that are just or unjust in our society, and hopefully better address them. Up until this point in the series, we have focused on the movement of one set of humans from the state of nature to society. This is a simplistic view which helps us understand the general reasoning, but it ignores a critical problem that society must deal with, other societies. In this episode of the Building Death series, we will address the problems that exist due to the existence of other civilizations. I'm Pragmatic Penguin, let's get to it. Humans in the state of nature are under constant threat. This fact, combined with the non-zero-sum potential of cooperation, led them to form a society. This is a story told in the first four lessons of the Building Up series. Now here's the thing, societies aren't all that different than humans. Societies, much like humans, are rational, in that they behave in their own self-interest. In a system of societies, or what we might call the international system, they are in their own version of the state of nature and the same ideas apply. Let's go deeper. Societies refer to social organization at all levels, and this point requires a bit of deliberation. The smallest and first unit of social organization is the family, which we will simplify to a group of 12 people. The force of the social bonds of such a small unit is often enough to disincentivize cheating or other antisocial behaviors, so they are able to cooperate freely to achieve the benefits of non-zero sumness in their relationships. Even at this level, government exists. There is often a leader of such a group. This is who decides where they will hunt, when they will rest, and what they will forage. The leader's ultimate concern is maximizing the general welfare of their family and keeping them safe. The leader will often act as the arbiter in cases of injustice, validating social behaviors and invalidating antisocial ones whenever they arise. These functions may be conducted via consensus as well, either between the high status members, usually elders, or all who are considered capable of making intelligently rational decisions, adults. For this example, we'll focus on the single leader family government. The family is a natural unit since trust is established early on, so the benefits of society are easily realized. With only 12 or so people, the family still has limited variety in capabilities and knowledge, especially given the genetic similarity of its members. Humans, being both intelligent and rational, are aware of these limitations. Early humans were nomadic, so these families would occasionally encounter each other. The others they would encounter would often have different skills and genetic material. They also may have had information and resources which they could trade. This doesn't come without risk. Most obvious is that two families have no grounds to trust each other. It is likely that they would see each other first, and it is not a given that they would be able to hopefully communicate, so they must decide and signal to each other that they intend no harm before they can move on to any other issues. This by itself may not be enough. One family views the other as encroaching on their territory, they may quickly escalate to violence, especially if there's any amount of resource insecurity. The cases where resources are plentiful and humans act in good faith can lead these two families to develop enough trust to begin communicating, exchanging information, whether it be technological, cultural, or genetic. All of these exchanges are to the benefit of both so long as they are reasoned out. The more they exchange, the more efficiently they can exchange in the future because the trust is stronger, until they reach the upper limit of how close they can become, that is, until they unify and become a tribe. 
Tribes may do the same and become chiefdoms. Chiefdoms become city-states. Those become nation-states, and possibly onwards. But this unifying process takes time, and is not always clean or pretty, as history will show us. So what's happening? As a unit of social organization grows, the administration of it gets significantly more complicated. A group of any 12 people thrown into a room and given a purpose will usually figure out how to cooperate to accomplish the mission. A leader or a consensus-based process will emerge from this group, and everyone will grow to know and trust each other. Now imagine if we did this with 100 people. How much longer would it take to establish a hierarchy? How much more cumbersome does consensus become? How long does it take for them to build that trust? Yes, still feasible, but it takes a bit of time, and the depths of the relationships will likely be sufficient to become stable. Moving into the thousands is where things become tricky especially given the technology of ancient times, requiring people to use more land and transit much more slowly. It now becomes impossible for people to really all know each other and to trust each other. If they did nothing but socialize, they may be able to accomplish such a feat, but they have work to do, farms to tend, livestock to herd, shoes to cobble. How do they know they can trust each other? The answer would be that they affiliate with each other. In some places, this is ethnic groups, in others it's clan-based, and in many societies today, it's based on national identity. These groupings are a shortcut to solving one of the fundamental problems with societies, that each individual is self-interested, but not always intelligently so. Let's build this out a bit. Throughout the series, I've used the word rational to describe humans, and I very quickly write down self-interested in parentheses, but I haven't taken a lot of time to address it. In the social sciences, Rational typically means self-interested. It's not a judgment, it's just the most natural starting point. Humans are hardwired to look out for themselves and themselves only. But by socializing from an early age and creating an environment which rewards cooperation, we have learned to consider others who are close to us as if they were ourselves. The problem that social identities address is that we can only get close to so many people before we hit a physical limit, where we cannot develop a social connection deep enough to truly consider the other person. Social identities trick us into considering the welfare of others who are remote to us because it makes them feel like part of us. Now that's the good of social identities, but they have a dark side. They are often exclusive. For example, someone in Nation A may be proud to be an A, and willing to lay down their life for the good of A's everywhere. But what do they think of the B's? Well, they aren't a B, they're an A. And because they're an A, the B's can't be trusted. The bees want to trade? Well, their stuff is cheaply made. And have you seen the way they wear their shoes? What kind of monster ties their shoes that way? Or wears a tan suit? Or mom jeans? This phenomenon is referred to as negative othering, and it's exactly how it sounds. While social identities serve to unify one group, it also creates a fissure with another, especially in more time the group has to develop distinct cultural practices and ideas. Negative othering is most problematic when there are problems within a society, as it leads to scapegoating issues onto disadvantaged groups instead of directly addressing the problem. Not only does this tend to lead to further marginalization, but the societal problem is never actually addressed and thus will continue to persist and get worse. Today's lesson built on the concept of rational actors and social organization to demonstrate the problems that the existence of multiple societies presents. By better understanding social organization, we are better equipped to identify the phenomenon of negative othering and begin to address how to overcome it. Providing security is one of the least controversial purposes of government, but its application is still the subject of plenty of debate. Today's lesson will narrow down what security looks like and remove some of the ambiguity that the term may present. I'm Pragmatic Penguin, let's get to it. Throughout the Building Debt series, the concept of the state of nature has been operating in the background but has never been the star of the show. Quite frankly, it doesn't need to be. The most important takeaway from the state of nature is that humans aren't the most fearsome predator in the wild. We don't have great claws or particularly scary jaws like a mountain lion. We don't have great strength or size like a gorilla. We don't have great hearing like a bat or eyesight like an eagle. We can't fly like a bird. We can't swim like a fish. We can't hold our breath like a gator. Our skin burns when in the sun too long, and we don't regrow limbs if we lose them to infection. These are but a small sample of how unsuited to the state of nature we are. Our great advantage is our minds and our ability to make tools, but those don't keep us safe when we sleep. What can keep us safe? Other people. 
They can keep watch while we sleep. They can build walls while we farm. They can scare off animals with their numbers. And they can create more efficient weapons to reduce the burden overall. But what about other people? Justice and the general welfare mitigate the issue of other people, but these concepts will overlap on many issues. Security from people who mean harm is to be handled by people who do not mean us harm. In other words, a peacekeeping force that is capable of overpowering those who intend to harm others must exist for the society to be secure. This is internal security and the justification for the existence of police in most societies. In an ideal society, police are unnecessary because social behaviors are so adequately rewarded that antisocial behaviors are unthinkable. The existence of a police force is a response to the realities of imperfect society and the variations of humans. Perfect rationality would lead to a society of pure incentives. Police, however, are a disincentive. Policing actions, or the use of force, is also a massive violation of personal sovereignty and so can only be justified if all other options to protect a victim's sovereignty have been exhausted. Poor public policy may be evidenced by an over-reliance on policing and could be an indicator of a society that is unstable. Security within a society is enhanced by providing for the general welfare and well-established justice, but security forces, or peacekeepers, are necessary when these inevitably fall short of providing safety within the society. This idea of security through general welfare and justice will be expanded upon in future lessons when we start looking at specific policy areas. Modern societies are often thought of as their political boundaries on a map, or as nation states. This conception is useful for analysis and definitions, but I will quickly point out that it is not the most accurate conception. The nation state can be more accurately described as a society of societies and peoples. There are families, ethnic groups, clubs, genders, classes, cities, territories, and other ways that people can and do identify with these societies, and these all have the risk of contributing to negative othering, especially if there are stressors on the population which can lead to irrational behavior in otherwise rational people. Once again, good public policy can alleviate the stressors portion, and this allows these groupings to form bonds with each other that can endure more trying times and disincentivize antisocial behavior. Within the same nation state, this is referred to as policing. Nation states interact with each other primarily through collective action, trade, finance, and military action. All of these can be grouped into the broad term of diplomacy, but to some extent, international interaction is similar to the interaction between individuals. They can work together, they can ignore each other, or they can harm each other. For the aspect of security, nations will build militaries as insurance against the loss of sovereignty from other states' militaries. Militaries, much like police forces, are the result of failure to act rationally by at least one party. Much like with police, an over-reliance on the military is an indicator of an unstable society. Governments aren't the only societal force that provides security, but their unique role is in providing a last resort option and are granted a monopoly on legitimate use of force for such a purpose. The reason for the monopoly is that people and markets simply aren't structured to fill the role. The impact of people on society is primarily through culture, which is informal and poorly defined. This can lead to a wildly inconsistent application of the use of force, and it also multiplies the number of force wielders, which the Jedi Council would not approve of, and creates more variation which leads to more outliers and can spiral into chaos. Government, alternatively, impacts society by applying order. An ordered application of force can be assessed, scaled, and understood. Markets, on the other hand, are primarily concerned with the efficient allocation of resources, which can lead to improper uses of force. While they benefit significantly from stability, Markets that are involved in arms sales or other war-profiting enterprises may use force to increase their own profits. Additionally, with a plethora of entities within markets, like corporations, we run into the same problem as we do with people as far as application goes. Markets and people do contribute to security. The excesses of markets can lessen resource scarcity, and a peaceful culture can reduce negative othering but they cannot be relied upon to do these functions by themselves and they do not meet the criteria for the use of force. Today's lesson focused on the government's role in providing security through their monopoly on the legitimate use of force and how it deals with the reality of outliers. We also looked at how an over-reliance on military and policing actions can indicate instability in a society. Most importantly, we introduced the idea that a focus on the general welfare and justice 
are more effective means to provide security. Most importantly, we introduce the idea that a focus on the general welfare and justice are more effective means to provide security than the use of force. Future lessons will look at specific policy areas and their impact on security through this lens. Promoting the general welfare is far and away the most controversial function of government due to how poorly defined and uncritically applied it is. The goal of this lesson is to adequately define what the general welfare looks like and establish clear limits on the concept. I'm Pragmatic Penguin, let's get to it. To understand the general welfare, we must briefly return to the state of nature. I know, we created society to escape, but we need to visit to remember precisely why. As you may recall from the first four videos of this series, non-zero sumness is the driving force behind the creation of society. While security and justice are both ways of preserving and distributing non-zero sumness, the promotion of the general welfare can be thought of as increasing the supply of non-zero sumness. There's a significant amount of overlap between the three concepts, but by thinking in terms of preserving, distributing, and growing non-zero sumness, we can more easily focus on the separate roles of government we have already defined. It is important at this point to address that these functions do not exist in a vacuum. Justice and security are just as important as the general welfare and need to be considered as such. The Rawlsian idea of justice as fairness helps us to prioritize what is and is not a moral government action. By applying justice to concepts of general welfare, we limit the government's role in a sensible way. That is where Rawls and social contract theory differs from the idea of utilitarianism. Let's get dystopian real quick. Imagine a society where a small group of people must work 18 hours a day, every day, for the entirety of their lives. But this creates a situation of such excess that the other 90% of society can live with pure freedom from any obligation. The utilitarian may be able to justify such a society by determining that after a specific point of working, there is a diminishing return on suffering and so the additional suffering is insignificant for the amount it improves the general welfare. In this fictional scenario, the utilitarians would determine, based on some fairly dubious math, that more workers would not substantially improve this free majority and less workers would cause the freedom to diminish, so they would be in an equilibrium which they claim is justified. By applying justice to the situation, we can concretely identify how both aspects are violating what is acceptable for government to do, because the defined principles are violated. The first is that liberty is completely removed from the small group, therefore making this action unjust. At this point, based on the definition of justice as fairness, the second principle doesn't need to be addressed. Even if it did, the inequality in the society specifically harms the least advantaged members of the society, and therefore it is not to the benefit of all and cannot be justified. Justice tames the general welfare as an instrument to produce excesses which improve our lives by examining the means by which we can accomplish our end state. Government operates on society through actions which create order, which is ideal for establishing justice and providing security, but the verb in the U.S. Constitution is vitally important for defining government's role with regards to the general welfare. The role is to promote the general welfare. The verb promote implies that government is a supporting entity rather than a primary one in this regard. The primary entities within society that establish the general welfare are people and markets. Markets influence society by efficiently allocating resources. While the entire field of economics is dedicated to describing how exactly it does this, the useful simplification is to describe it in terms of supply-demand curves. Markets respond to demands by creating supply. To do this, they innovate, they streamline, they invent, they specialize. You get the idea. Ultimately, this results in the formation of large companies which can take advantage of mass production to create lots of products cheaply and distribute them widely to all who want it. And in return, they make a profit, which is their rational driver for this behavior. Now, this behavior is rational, but it is amoral. Markets are pursuing their self-interest just like everyone else, and they create great excesses in the process. This can result in monopolies, price gouging, overworking, or other behaviors which abuse the workers or the customers either physically or psychologically. This can also lead to massive inequality since demand curves have a supply side, and that supply is capital in the case of markets. If there's no capital to be gained, then the market will not supply the demand signal. These troubles are the negative externalities of an unregulated market and are the justification by which governments intervene. With regards to creating inequality, markets can justify this action if it's to the benefit of all or at the very least neutral. This is done by increasing the size of the economic pie. If the pie keeps growing and the proportion of everyone's slice stays the same or shrinks by less than the volume increased from the growth, then the inequality is justified and requires no government action. 
actions that shrink the proportion, like rent-seeking behaviors, or increase the size slower than the proportion, like lowering wages, warrant government's intervention to promote the general welfare. Culture impacts the general welfare of society in a quite a different way. By having an inclusive culture that values individuals, promotes productive, healthy, and peaceful lifestyles, and actively challenges people to personally grow, societies maximize their non-zero-sum potential. While this is ideal, this is not the reality, and people will not agree to live in a society where these behaviors are forced because it would limit their liberty in an overly invasive way, and thus violate our first principle of justice as fairness. When it comes to the concept of the general welfare with regards to people, there are no examples that I can come up with that justify government intervention in this regard. If you disagree and have some, please drop them down in the comments below. Today's lesson introduced a new conception of society's first principles of security, justice, and the general welfare as ways in which non-zero-sumness is preserved, distributed, and grown. We then showed the limiting effect of justice on the general welfare to prevent a dystopian society. Finally, and most importantly, we define government as a supporting entity to bring order to the efficiency of the market. This lesson concludes the most abstract and philosophical portion of the Building Debt series. Future videos will use the analytical tools developed throughout the series to look at specific policy areas in greater depth. If you made it to the end of this video, I just want to say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like and comment your thoughts down below, and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell, so you never miss out on more content just like this.